Well, I hope everybody had a good weekend. I, I have a question before we start on today's topic. Um, what are you seeing in terms of level of activity from new inquiries, whether it's on the buyer side or on the seller side? Are you, in, in, in other words, people reaching out, people that are coming to you, has that pace, would you say it's the same, better or worse than it was four months ago? Where do you see things? And I don't know if any of you keep records on it. Um, I would say more so, I wouldn't say, I guess, new inquiries. But maybe it's what, people, new? I said not new, but maybe just people I'd already spoke to that were holding on. Right. They're like, okay, this is It's time it to do something. Okay. Like, okay, we're open to looking All at right. this again. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, I got a lot. Of, I have quite a few people from like uh, they just don't want to pay rent. They're like rent prices are crazy. Like, oh, I don't know rent prices, but people are telling me like twenty five hundred, three thousand. They're like, I might as well just go buy. So a lot of people, a lot of, I think for like a month or two, like I guess buyers got scared, but now I feel like at least for my target audience, they're heavily coming back now um, by saying they don't want. So are they new inquiries or are they people that have? Inquiry. They're new inquiries, yeah. so yours are increasing. I'd say, yeah. Okay, good. Anybody else? I think mine are down. Down? Yeah. Okay. All right. The re you know, one of the things that I would encourage is to track, in some manner, your new inquiries. Whether you're initiating that effort through cold calling or whether it's coming from your database, whatever it happens to be. But somehow, I would encourage you to track um, your, the new, what I call new inquiries. New inquiries are those people who are contacting you and would like information that you're actually going to be in communication with them. Now, it does, when I say this, I'm not talking about anything sophisticated. And I'll explain why this is of value to do. In my all, you know, I, these are my Bibles, my notebooks. I carry these around. But in the back, all I do in the back is I just put in the name of the person, the referral partner, and the date that I... It's not just the date I spoke to them. In my case, it's did I send them an application and a checklist. doesn't mean that they did anything with it, but, you know, did they say to me, yes, Greg, let's go ahead and start that process. That, so that's my kind of criteria for my, what I call new inquiries, and I have years of that information. Why is that important? Well, for me it's important because I like to know has my market gone up, gone down, what, what's normal, what's not normal, because it allows me to know how to plan on what I should be doing. Now obviously from 2020, 2021 in the mortgage business was stupid because not only did you get referrals on, from you folks on buyers, but we would also have all of these crazy refinances coming in. So the numbers were horribly exaggerated. And if you stripped out all the refinances, then you could just look at your, I used to put a little R there, really fancy way to do this, just a little R, and manually go calculate it. But you could, I can see trends in where things are going. For example, do you happen to know the busiest month of the year for you with people that are either taking that you want they want to go out to look at homes on the buyer side or your success in getting listing appointments which month is the biggest month of the year for you april april june june, june. july, july? The reason I'm asking that is that becomes a value when you're doing your personal planning. Like I know for Michelle and I, don't plan anything for January. January is typically one of our two closest, slowest closing months, but it's always the busiest month of the year for new inquiries. So it's very difficult for us to do anything in the month, go out in the month of January. If we do, We've got to do a lot of planning or we're going to have a whole bunch of stress. So I would advise that just so that you keep a record of what's going to happen in your business. And it's, it's just such a simple thing to do, but it's a value. Now, 
How does that relate to what we're talking about today? Well, today I said I want to give you some tools. Remember last week we talked about, you know, why, you know, buyers that want to go out and use their own lender. <clears throat> and you folks were kind and gave me a lot of information about, you know, they're going out to use this lender and you can't control it and they're going to do whatever they want to do. And I get it. You and I both know that's just what they're going to do. Nothing we can do about that. That, you know, you hope that you can have a relationship with that lender at some point so that you can help drive the process <clears throat> or get to know more about the process so that you can, you can help them out. <clears throat> the, give you an example. This past week, I get a call from Worrell. <clears throat> Worrell's got a client that is working with a very large um, big box bank. And, you know, Worrell said, Greg, they will not give me any information. I mean, I call them up. They won't tell me virtually anything. And he said, Greg, I've been trying to encourage my customer to talk to you. So I do speak with the customer. And it's an older gentleman, nice, nice man. But he doesn't quite understand everything. So what he does is he says to me on the phone, he said, well, Worrell said I should talk to you. Maybe we should do this as a backup just in case the big box bank, I'm not mentioning their name, um, doesn't come through. And I said, well, that's really not how this works. Um, you know, you're under contract. If it were pre-approval, different story, but you're under contract. You're closing in, at that time, they were closing in 28 days. And I said, you know, you don't want two lenders doing this because we're both going to have to order appraisals. Why would you want to spend $1,100 when you only have to spend $550? That doesn't make any sense. And quite frankly, you got them doing all the work, me doing all the work, and you're going to have to have overnight expenses because he doesn't use electronic. Everything has to be hand signed. And so I said, it just, so I said, I got Worrell on the phone and we talked and I said, let's see where the big box bank is at. And through that, I was able to tell them, look, keep it with the big box bank at this point. It sounds to me like they've got the process underway. And I explained to the customer, I said, look, I know they're not giving Worrell any information. That makes Worrell very nervous and probably makes you a little bit nervous. But, you know, I happen to know that institution. I don't, they're not going to be lying to you or anything, they're just, they're just not going to be very communicative. Let's put it that way. And I said, so here are some things that you can do that Worrell, this is how you can facilitate some of this and we keep it over there. Now, the reason I bring that up is because Worrell did a fabulous job of moving that customer over to potentially doing a loan with me and I talked them out of it. But what are the questions, what are the things that you can bring up with a customer or with a buyer, buying customer that would hopefully help them evaluate why they should use a lender that you would choose versus a lender that they're choosing? What are some things that you say to people to help make that transition, if it's even possible, but just to make it possible? What would you say to a buyer? Sure. Ideas out there. Okay. So they really don't know the other person. They haven't used them before. Would you be willing to talk to someone else just to get a second opinion? Okay. Somebody else. You could just have someone local. Um, someone local. Someone local. Yep. Okay. As opposed to having somebody in New York or Detroit or California or someplace else. Okay. Somebody local. Second opinion type thing. Okay. What else? What else can you ask or say? <laughs> they just don't think to go to somebody sure. else, even okay. though they don't necessarily like who they are working there. <clears throat> sure. All right. Anybody else? I think Anybody else? The question of what's, what's important to you about the lender 
Okay. But somebody just says rate is all I care about. Then yeah. Different and there are some people like that. That's just the way it is. I mean, it's whether we like it or we don't like it, it's what it is. So I'm of the belief whenever we're in sales, if I try to tell somebody to do something or I'm trying to, and I, when I say tell, I don't mean it that way, but I'm giving statements so that they'll be encouraged to you know, do what I would like them to do, I find that that puts up barriers. And I'm trying to knock down the barriers, not build up the barriers. People have a tendency to be defensive. Now, they trust you because you're going to be their real estate agent. Yet, you can advise them on, you want to close it here, you want to use this for the mortgage, you want to possibly use this for insurance, whatever else you want to. And guess what? In many cases, it throws up some barriers. Why? Not because they don't trust you. They obviously trust you. But because why? What's behind the scene? They trust you, but what's behind the scene as to why they just won't take your advice at that point? What's behind the scene? What do you think is behind the scene? Well, they typically already have their mindset that they think they know what's best for them. They think they know what's best for them. Okay. What else? I'm sorry? Okay, they don't. Exactly. What else? Fear. What's that? Fear. Fear. Okay. Here's something that's behind the scene that we oftentimes don't think about. They're wondering, believe it or not, this is true. They're wondering, why are you advising Greg? Are you getting paid? So, you know, again, bear in mind, they trust you, but at the same time behind the scene, they're wondering to themselves, why are you so adamant that I should go to your lender, go to Greg or whoever? Because they're not going to say this to you, but what are you getting for this? So if I know that going in, then what I'm trying to do to establish further trust or move them here is to give them some information or ask through a series of questions because questions seem to take the barriers down rather than put the barriers up. So if I'm going to do that, there are some questions that I can ask that are hopefully going to, you know, one, relieve some of that fear and number two, you know, give them some information they wouldn't otherwise know. So let's start with the first one. I, you know, the fear that you might be getting compensated somehow, that's why they're, you're doing business here. It's not that Greg is better than anybody else, but he's paying you, he's doing something. So if we know that, then what are some things that you might be able to say or I might be able to say to help relieve that, especially in terms of questions rather than just statements? What are things we could ask them to without saying it, but what are the questions we could ask them that would get rid of that question or that defense thing in their mind? Anybody have any ideas? I don't really lay it out up front. You know, these are folks that I work with that I trust. Uh, you know, there, there's, no, there's nothing I get in return here. It's just people that I know can get closed and do a good job for you. Okay. So I just try and nip it in the butt off the sure. like, first conversation. Mm -hmm. There's no give and take here. Yeah, okay. Anybody else? You know, one of the first questions that I'll, I would say is one of the first ones, but in my process of speaking with somebody and learning about them, it's always about conversation. You and I have heard Mike talk a lot about, when he talks about sales, about the whole idea of create conversation. Because inside conversation is where you can, not only do they get to know you, do, do I get to know them, it conversation makes it simpler. So one of the things that I like to ask people in my conversation as I'm learning about them and asking other questions, I said, by the way, why do you think Leah referred you to me? Just out of curiosity, did Leah say anything? And most of the time they say, well, no, she said she knows you. And I said, well, if you don't mind, let me just start by saying, Leah gets absolutely no nothing for doing this other than two important things for Leah. And they say, what's that? 
I said, the first one is she controls it. Because I do business with Lee on an ongoing basis, and she can ask anything. She knows everybody on my team. She controls the process so that you don't have to. So that's a benefit to you. That's the first reason why Leah does it. The second thing is, Leah's had many experiences with us, with me and with our team, that have led people to want to come back to her and to me. That's the only thing. I just want to make sure you know, there's no compensation. Leah doesn't get anything from a compensating standpoint other than a good experience and hopefully future business. Does that? help at all. That's the kind of conversation I have with them. Then I switch gears and go into them, you know, go into something else. So, because I know in the back of their minds, they're thinking about that. They're thinking, Chris, you're pushing Greg. You may not be pushing, but that's what they're thinking. You're pushing Greg, or you're pushing this or that, and why? What's in the background? What are you getting? And so we've got to, we want to dispel that as much as reasonably possible. Um, some of you may give out two or three different names. And that's one of the things they tell you in real estate school to do that. They say you have to do that. That's a bunch of garbage. You don't have to do that. It's what they want you to do, but it's up to you. But a lot of people who give out two or three names, they usually put one name at the top and say, whatever you do, be sure you call this person here first. And they, same thing. As soon as you say that to them, Guess what? Their mind, what are you getting out of this? So, all right. Now, the other thing, and I'm going to go to what Lanier said a moment ago, fear. The other thing that can move people from, you know, saying, I'm going to use my lender to going someplace else. And Jessica, you mentioned, you asked them, what, what's your thought about the other lender? Good question to ask because you'll get some, you'll find out a little bit, how, how do they really feel? One of the things I like to do, without you getting into the mortgage business, but a couple questions that you can ask. I mean, typically, don't you ask if you're dealing with a buyer, have you thought about a down payment? And if so, how much would you be putting down? That's a pretty normal question a real estate agent would ask their buyer. So you get a feel if they're gonna put down 5%, 10%, 20%, 25%, they're going to they're gonna ask that question. And you don't want to get into any other details, but if they tell you that they're going to put down 5 or 10% um, or 15% down, something of that nature, one of the things most lenders never talk to their people about, at least not on the front end, is something called single premium mortgage insurance. I have won so many deals by just simply asking the question, they've already spoke to another lender, now they're talking to me, and I'm trying to just get to know them, go through this whole thing, I'm not knocking the other lender, I'm supporting and everything else, and as I'm asking them questions and they say, we're thinking about putting 10% down, something I'll ask that you won't typically ask is, I'll ask them about their credit scores, so let's just, and if they've got modest credit scores, I mean decent credit scores, I might say to them, I might ask them the question, I said, by the way, did the other lender say anything to you about something called single premium mortgage insurance, which means you never have to pay mortgage insurance on a monthly basis as long as you have the loan? Did they say anything about that to you? I, I don't know that I've ever had somebody say, oh, yes, they did. I know all about that. I just don't hear that because lenders, most lenders are transactional, not relational, and all they're trying to do is get that deal. So what happens is they don't talk about that. I don't know if they're going to take single premium or monthly premium, but guess what? Go to what Lanier said, fear. If I ask the question and they say the lender never said anything about it, and I say, well, everybody can do this. It's just making sure we do what's right for you. And it's maybe a little premature to talk about it now, but there is that option available. What do you think that does in the mind of a buyer if they've already spoke to somebody else and now they're speaking to me? Why didn't they that? Yeah, why didn't they say something? Is that going to move them to make a change? No. But what it is going to do, it's going to create that doubt. 
I didn't tell them. I asked them. They told me. I mentioned something short and sweet, didn't go into a lot of detail, but it might save them some money. All right? That's one, that's one, one question I like to ask because I know lenders don't bring it up, and that's a big deal. All right? Now, next one I like to ask is depending how much money they're putting down. People think that putting down, to, and you know this one, you've heard me say it before, people think that putting 20% down is such a great deal. And it potentially can be. But if somebody says, well, you know what, I'd really like to get the 20% down, but I just don't know if I've got the money, so I'm thinking I might put down 10% or 15% or something of that nature. And, I, and, they'll say, and they'll say, well, why do you want to put down 20%? And they'll say, well, then I don't have to pay PMI. And I say, Okay, that's true, but why else? And they say, well, I think that's really what's going to get my payment down lower and blah, blah, blah. And I say, okay, fine. So let's just look at that for a minute. So 20% down does eliminate PMI. I said, but are you aware that if you have high enough credit scores and you put 15% down, 10% down, there's a way that you never have to pay monthly mortgage insurance? And they say, no, I didn't know that. I said, did you also know this? I said, maybe your other lender said something to you about this or not. I don't know. But do you know that at 15% down versus 20% down, <coughs> you'll get a better interest rate with 15% down than you will at 20%? Did your other lender mention that? No. That doesn't even make sense. I said, you know what? You're right. It doesn't. But that's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. And that's the case across the, across the industry, every lender. I said, it's disappointing that people don't mention that more often. You don't have to put down 20%. Now, if you put down 25, then you'll get a better rate. But it's, and it's not like it's a huge amount. I mean, it's an eighth difference. So it's not like it's a big deal. But I just think the more options you have, the better. What do you think? Doubt number two. Right away, they start. Now they've got two things in their, in their mind that are creating some, creating some doubt. Well, wait a minute once. What's the other lender or not? telling me and I said now one other thing and that's putting down more money because you're thinking you might want to put down you're worried about that you'll be nice if you could put down 10 10 percent rather than five percent and it's a four hundred thousand dollar home so that's twenty thousand dollars and I said that's a lot of money twenty thousand dollars do you have are you just like flush with cash well no 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 that's why we're doing this I said well just and maybe your other lender said something to you, I don't know or not, but do you know what the payment difference is between 5% down and 10% down on a $400,000 loan? And they say, no, I hadn't thought about that. I said, for every $1,000, it's approximately $6, approximately. And I said, so think about that. You're gonna save $120 a month by investing $20,000 more. They go, that's nothing. I said, well, that's right. And that's all we're trying to do is just find out what are going to be the best options for your scenario. If you're cash rich, put down the extra 10, 20 grand. Who cares? Drop your payment on 20 bucks. But if you're not cash rich, you're buying your first home or your second home, you're going to have to put some things into the house. That, what could you do with $20,000 more? So, from your perspective, the idea of it is, how can you create doubt that the other person, the other lender they're speaking to, is truly opening up all the information to them? Again, whether you put down 15% or 20%, every lender is going to have the same thing. 50% down is going to get an eighth better than 20%. Every lender, not just me. But if they don't ever say anything about it, that works to your advantage because you can now create doubt. Creating that doubt helps them consider, doesn't mean they will, but consider using the lender or the vendor of your choice. And that helps you. That helps you a great deal without having to tell them anything. The same, the PMI thing. You don't have to get into details. You don't have to do any of that. Hey. Just you're aware if you're going to pay PMI, not FHA, by the way. This is just conventional, not FHA. But if, you know, if they're going to, you know, you don't have to pay PMI on a monthly basis. That's just an option. You might want to just talk to, you know, 
If you don't know that, I don't know why your other lender didn't say anything. I know Greg, because he teaches us stuff. The last thing is FHA versus conventional. When people tell me that they're definitely going to go FHA, and that's fine. I love FHA loans. One of my first questions is, I shouldn't say first one. They tell me they're going to go FHA. I say, okay, fine, thank you. And I'll ask another question or two, and then I'll go back to that. I said, just out of curiosity, why, do you, why are you, like, so set on, on uh, FHA? And they'll, they'll say, well, first of all, it's a lesser down payment, and, um, you know, I'm just thinking it's first-time homebuyer program might be better for me. I said, okay, that's interesting. And they'll say, you know, it's first-time homebuyer. And everybody in this room, I think, knows first-time home buyer in the mortgage industry is defined by what? First-time home buyer. What is a first-time home buyer to a, to a mortgage lender? What's that? They haven't owned a home in the last three years. How many people really? Here, I'm sitting with a room of real estate agents, and you're not sure yourself. Think about the buyers out there. They think a first-time homebuyer program is the greatest deal out there. And what they're not even realizing is that a first-time homebuyer is only somebody who hasn't owned a home in the last three years. You could have owned 10 homes before that. All right. So, they, okay, fine. You want to you get first-time homebuyer. And I'll usually ask them, do you know what that means in the mortgage lending industry? And they say no. So I explain that one to them. And then I say, now, why, why else are you thinking about FHA? Well, FHA is a smaller down payment. I said, oh, really? And they'll say, well, isn't it? And I said, well, maybe, maybe. I mean, if you're buying a condo, yeah, it'll save you 1.5%. But if you're buying a um, regular stick-built home and you're a first-time home buyer, you can do it with 3% down versus 3.5% down. What? I said, yeah, that's all you got to put. I thought you had to put 20% down. No, just 3%. Now, you may not want to put down 3%. You might want to find a way to get to 5% down if we show it to you, but you don't have to. I said, FHA is a great program. I'm not knocking FHA, but FHA is designed if you've got credit score issues that are not 100% where you want them, then that's where you want to look at FHA. And I would just hope if you're using us or if you're using another lender, most important thing is make sure you know all your options. Now, those kind of conversations I'm having, but those kind of conversation pieces of that you can have, because if you're doing those kind of conversations, you can move people from where they're at here to where you want them to be without having to make a lot of statements. You're basically asking questions, and guess what you're doing? You're creating doubt in what their decision appears to be. And when you do that, you'll have some success. Any comments? because we're right at time. All right, thank you everybody, appreciate it.